Shabbat Shalom. The title of this message is Deals with the Enemy. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 20 and verse 35. We're going to read 1 Kings chapter 20, verses 35 to 43. When you have it, say amen. 1 Kings chapter 20, verses 35 to 43. When you have it, say amen. And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor in the word of the Lord, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man refused to smite him. Then said he unto him, Because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. Then he found another man and said, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man smote him, so that in smiting he wounded him. So the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king and said, Thy servant went out in the midst of the battle. And behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me and said, Keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. And thy servant was busy here and there, and he was gone. And the king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be, thyself hath decided it. And he hasted, and took the ashes away from his face. And the king of Israel discerned him that he was of the prophets. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. And the king of Israel went to his house heavy and displeased and came to Samaria. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, not my words, but your words. We pray, Lord, that you would open up our understanding for this message today, that your people may be, may be able to understand and may apply these things to their lives. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, at this point in the nation of Israel's history, the Syrians seemed to be the superpower of their time because of Israel's rebellion against God and Ahab's defiance. God had permitted the Syrians to oppress them. Ben-Hadad sent messages to the king of Israel saying that his riches, his livelihood, his wives, and his children now all belonged to him. Now, imagine how insulting this must have been. Someone sending a messenger to tell you that everything you have now belongs to someone else. Gold and silver, material things might not matter as much, but when someone says that your wife and your children are now theirs to do with as they please, to treat as they please, imagine how you would feel. Ahab was in no position to argue. He submitted and he agreed to these conditions, saying that everything he had now belonged to the king of Syria. But as if this wasn't enough, Ben-Hadad takes it a step further and says that he would send additional messengers to search the king of Israel's house and the house of his servants, and these messengers would take anything they found that might be of value, that might be good in the sight of the king. This way, just in case they had left anything out before, now they make sure they get it. This would add insult to injury. Ahab understood that Ben-Hadad was seeking a quarrel against him. His words to the elders suggest that Ben-Hadad was doing what was unnecessary. Ben-Hadad was flexing his muscles. He was just showing off. And Ahab was without power to do anything about it. He had submitted to the king, but rather than show compassion, rather than show mercy, the king of Syria seemed not to miss an opportunity to rub his dominance in Ahab's face. Ben-Hadad was in charge, and he wanted Ahab to know he was in charge, and Ahab could do nothing about it. Maybe you've been in a situation where someone wanted to let you know that they were in charge, 
and someone would just rub it in your face and make you feel powerless to do anything about it. The elders counseled Ahab, and they told him not to listen. And when ben heard that Ahab agreed to give his original request, but not the latter request, he was enraged. And so we go to 1 Kings chapter 20 and verse 10. 1 Kings chapter 20 and verse 10. And ben sent unto him and said, The gods do so unto me, and more also, if the dust of Samaria shall suffice for handfuls for all the people that follow me. And Ahab responds, and he tells ben not to boast himself as one who has won a battle before he's actually fought it. And at those words, the king of Syria sent an army to encompass the city. Now, in spite of Ahab's rebellion, God did not leave his people to the outcome that ben was hoping for. A prophet was sent to Ahab, and God declared that this army encamped against them would soon be given into Ahab's hands. Going down to verse 13, And behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it into thine hand this day, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. And Ahab said, By whom? And he said, Thus saith the Lord, Even by the young men of the princes of the provinces, then he said, Who shall order the battle? And he answered, Thou. As things went down, God kept his promise. The Syrians were defeated with a great slaughter. ben managed to escape, fleeing for his life. Soon after the vic these victories were won, the prophet returned to the king of Israel again. And this time he warned the king that ben would return after a year's time and to watch carefully how he would strengthen himself. Now, as the Syrians began to contemplate their loss, the servants of the king suggested that it was because they fought the Israelites in the hills that they lost the battle. They reasoned that the God of Israel was a God of the hills. And it was only because they fought the Israelites on God's turf that they lost the battle. And so they reasoned that if they were to take them on in the plains, they would be able to overcome them in battle. You see, the Syrians limited God to a particular geographical location. They believed that if they could remove God's people from, the, from this geographical location over which God was sovereign, that the Israelites would fall. Somehow, they had forgotten that God has made the heavens. God has made the earth. God has made the sea. And they believed that God was only restricted to the hills. And so God sent a prophet to the king of Israel to answer the challenge of the Syrians. Verse 28. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. And they pitched over one against the other seven days. And so it was that in the seventh day, the battle was joined. And the children of Israel slew the Syrians and hundred thousand foot soldiers in one day. Have you ever been in a situation where your circumstances looked impossible? Where the odds were stacked against you and nothing seemed to go in your favor? Are there people in your life that try to limit the power of your God? I want to let you know this morning that only God, God is not only the God of the hills. God is not only the God of the church building. God is the God of creation. And his territory extends far past your situation. The king of Syria had to learn that you can't minimize God. And sometimes when we face our challenges, we too must learn that we cannot minimize God. There are times when we try to minimize God and we say things like, Lord, you got me out of that circumstance. Lord, I know that you can handle that challenge, but I don't know about this one. Sometimes we make our problems bigger than the God that can take us through them. But God is not limited to our narrow views and skewed perspective of those who don't believe. 
And sometimes all, all we need to get through our circumstances is just a little more faith. And so we find that the Israelites had won yet another battle. And Benadad was afraid for his life. He who was once proud, he who was once boastful, he who was once cruel and inflexible, when he placed himself against God's chosen in battle, those whom God protected, he was utterly defeated. Verse 31, And his servant said unto him, Behold now, we have heard the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let us, I pray thee, put sackcloth on our loins and ropes upon our heads and go out to the kings of Israel. Preadventure he will save thy life. So they girded sackcloth on their loins and put ropes on their heads and came to the king of Israel and said, Thy servant Ben-Hadad saith, I pray thee, let me live. And he says, Is he yet alive? He is my brother. Now imagine the nerve of this king. When he asked for gold and silver, Ahab did not deny him. When he stated that he owned Ahab's wife and children, Ahab did not resist him or put forth an argument. But all that was not enough for Ben-Hadad. He wanted his messengers to embarrass Ahab further, searching for his property and the property of his servants. But whereas at first his enemies overcame him and belittled him, whereas at first he was at the mercy of his enemies, with God on his side, Ahab's enemies were put to shame. And this is a lesson for us today, that at times when we don't have God in our lives, our enemies may persevere over us. We may be in challenges that seem to overtake us. We may be in challenges that mock us or things that exercise dominion over us. In our own strength, we may be powerless to face the trials of life circumstances and, and whatever it brings us. But when God is on your side, everything that is against you is put to shame. Now, realizing his de defeat, Ahab's enemies decided to counsel him to seek the mercy and compassion of the king of Israel. Mercy and compassion, which he himself would not show. They humbled themselves and came before the king of Israel, and Ahab calls Benadad, my brother. What? Ahab calls Benadad, my brother. Now, these were the people that God had appointed for destruction. They were a snare to the children of Israel and had undermined the God of Israel. With their mouths, they had verbally challenged God and said he was powerless to face them in the plains. God answered that challenge, and now Ahab was seeking to make a brother out of one who had insulted his heavenly father. Ahab constantly made leagues with people whom he should not have made leagues with. When these powers were given the advantage, they treated him spitefully and trampled on his dignity. They insulted his God. And yet Ahab calls Ben-Hadad, my brother. There are times when God blesses us, and rather than continuing to thrive and to conquer, we make deals with the enemy. Sometimes in the church, our interest in winning souls, we kind of forget about the standards. The world can sometimes convert the church rather than the church converting the world. And we can compromise our beliefs and call people my brother who have never been introduced to Christ. Ahab seems to have felt that through this relationship he was solidifying his future, not realizing that the only hope for the future, his only security, could be found in none other than God himself. Ahab and Benadad make a covenant that all that was taken from Israel would be restored. And that Ahab would gain the streets in Damascus, just as the Syrians had taken streets in Samaria. He agrees to the terms and sends Ben-Hadad alive on his way. He allows his enemy to escape. Sometimes we too 
let the enemy escape. There are times when God gives us victories over things, and rather than get rid of it entirely, we allow some things to remain. God may have brought us out of a bad relationship, but we're still holding on to the phone number. God may have brought us out of sexual immorality, but we still hold on to a few movies and magazines. God may have brought us out of health challenges, but we're still doing a little bit of those things which brought us those challenges in the first place. Many of us have been given victory over certain things, but in some ways we're still holding on to sin. We are allowing our enemy to escape rather than having the complete victory, rather than dealing with it completely and with finality. And when we allow the enemy to escape, and we don't take hold of the complete victory, the very things that we allow to escape our attention can be our undoing. They are often the things which come back to haunt us. God did not give Ahab a partial victory. God did not look to only partially deliver you from your challenges. God wants to give you a complete deliverance. And so when God gives victory and places victory in your hand, he gives you total victory, and we sometimes allow defeat to come upon us. We let our defeated foes go. We allow defeated problems to resurface in our lives. We allow conquered obstacles to become challenges in our lives because we refuse to have total victory. Holding on to things in our lives which God needs us to let go of. Ahab was holding on to Ben-Hadad. He was keeping the cause of his problems around a little longer. And sometimes we get into trouble when we allow mistakes of our past to hang around a little longer rather, rather than conquer them in Jesus' name. When God gives our challenges into our hands, he wants us to have complete dominion over them. He wants those obstacles removed completely. And so the Bible says in verse 35, And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor in the word of the Lord, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man refused to smite him. Then he said unto him, Because thou hast, obeyed the vo because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. Then he found another man and said, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man smote him, so that in smiting he wounded him. So the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. So here we see that God appointed, that what God appointed, he expected to be carried out. The prophet asked the man to let him have it. But the man refused even though it was expressed that this thing was of the Lord. So rather than smite what God had told him to smite, he finds an excuse not to do it. However, things did not go so well for this individual. His disobedience led him to his death at the mouth of a lion. And sometimes when we choose to do our own thing instead of doing God's will, disobedience comes back to bite us. Soon the prophet finds another man. And this one is more willing to do the will of God than the one before. Although this was a strange request, this man understood that if God called for it, he must have a purpose in it. So he strikes the servant of God, and the prophet goes on his way. And this was an illustration that when God puts something into your hand, we need to deal with it entirely. And so the prophet disguises himself and puts across a parable to the king of, of, of Israel. Verse 39. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king, and he said, Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle, and behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me, and said, Keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. And thy servant was busy here and there, and he was gone. And the king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be, thyself hast decided it. 
reminiscent of Nathan and David. A prophet will sometimes use a parable to cut to the heart. And the hearer would condemn something or someone only to realize that he was condemning himself. In this story, he points out that when something is given into your hand, you become responsible for what, has, for what happens with what is delivered to you. You heard Jesus say, to whom much is given, much is what? Required. In this case, the king of Syria was given into the hand of Israel. But rather than put an end to their problems, they allowed them to live and escape. How often do we too run away from complete and total victory? Are there some areas of our lives where God has given us victory, but we're making compromises with the enemy? Are there some things that God wants us to let go of, and we're still holding on? God had appointed Ahab to completely destroy his enemies, yet he was refusing to do it. Verse 41, and he hasted and he took the ashes from away from his face. And the king of Israel discerned him that he was of the prophets. And he said unto him, thus saith the Lord, because thou hast let go of thy hand, out of thine hand, a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life and thy people for his people. And the king of Israel went to his house heavy and displeased and came to Samaria. One of the lessons that we can learn from this story is that disobedience bites. It may not be a lion in your path, but it is better for us to obey God's word. Sometimes we don't know the dangers that we avoid when we put our trust in what God says. Ahab's disobedience would cause him to lose his life. And we need to stop making deals with the enemy. We need to eliminate those things in our lives which keep us from following Christ. We need to remove all things that distract us and focus on God. Rather than holding some small part of it, we need to let our past not continue into the present or the future. We need to let sin go. Maybe like Ahab, you too have made deals with the enemy. But now you realize that there's really a great danger in doing so. And you're ready to receive the total victory from God. You're ready to part with those things that are holding you back from a full commitment. If this is your desire, I invite you to stand and pray with me. Heavenly Father, your people have heard your word. Help us, Lord, to make a full commitment to you and help us to serve you without reserve. Help us, Father, that when you give us victory over our challenges and victory over our circumstances, victory over our sins, that we would not allow those things to remain in our lives, but that we would part with them entirely. Help us, Lord, to follow you and to give you our whole hearts. These mercies we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Happy Sabbath.